All right, so this chapter is going to be the first of two chapters we're um, talking about plant diversity. We're going to get into a little bit of the history of plants in terms of how they've evolved and the different parts that they have that have allowed them to be able to live on land. And we'll start getting into some of the phyla that are associated with plants. So for the first three billion years, there was not anything living on the ground on Earth. Um, cyanobacteria, they believed, um, started to exist around 1.2 billion years ago. And then around 500 million years ago was when we started to see some form of plants and fungi and animals on land. Um, and obviously, once they got a hold of land and started colonizing it, they have diversified. Um, so the land plants that we have now um, have some form of terrestrial ancestor. Um, some land plants are now aquatic, but even if they were aquatic plants, they had a terrestrial ancestor at some point. They don't include the algae and they are um, a source of oxygen and a great source of food for land animals. Um, the charophytes that we talked about in chapter 28, the green algae, are the closest relatives evolutionary-wise to land plants. Um, and a lot of the characteristics that we see in the land plants, we will also see in the protist class, especially with the algae. Um, land plants is, um, share four traits with the charophytes, the rings of cellulose synthesizing complexes, peroxisome enzymes, flagellated sperm, and a phragmoplast. Um, so the, if we look at their nuclear genes and the chloroplast genes, the charophytes are the closest living relatives of land plants, but they are not, the land plants are not descended from them. They just share that common ancestor. So there's the chara, right? And then there is a land plant that lives in ponds. Okay. Um, Parophytes have a layer of, of uh, durable polymer. It's called sporopollenin that keeps their zygotes from drying out. We see this also on plant spore walls. Um, so there were benefits to moving onto land um, by the charophyte ancestors. Um, lots of sunlight, lots of carbon dioxide, soil that had not been used. It had lots of nutrients in it, not a whole lot of... Um, herbivores or pathogens, things that could um, destroy the plants, but there were issues in terms of water and not having the support of water to be able to stand. So some of the traits that they've accumulated um, were, again, to be able to survive on land and allow them to continue to colonize it. Um, there's some debate about the plant kingdom boundaries, whether the algae should be a part of it. And so I'm totally fine with y'all referring to plants as a kingdom, but you will also hear them called embryophytes um, because they are known as plants that contain embryos. Okay, so this is just kind of giving you, showing you the relationship um, with the red algae and the chloroplasts and the charophytes and the embryophytes, aka our plants. And the plants, again, are what we're going to be focusing on and seeing what traits have evolved over time for plants while they have colonized land. Okay, derived traits, traits that are present only in the plants but not in the charophytes. Um, the alternation generations that we've talked about previously in terms of their um, cycle, um, multicellular um, dependent embryos, the walled spores that are produced in sporangia, the multicellular gametangia, and the apical meristems. And we'll talk about each of those coming up. So first thing we're going to look at are the alternation generations, how they go between the two multicellular stages. Gametophyte is haploid and can produce haploid gametes by mitosis, in other words, just copying its chromosomes, while fusion of the gametes gives you the diploid sporophyte, and then the diploid sporophyte can produce haploid spores by meiosis. So that's where we're getting the genetic um, variation. And the diploid embryo is held in the female gametophyte. And then nutrients are transferred between the two uh, by placental transfer cells. And we talked about how the land plants are called embryophytes because the embryo cannot exist on its own and it has to depend on the parent. All right, so we've seen this one before going back to our meiosis chapter. The walled spores 
Um, the sporophyte produces spores and organs that are the sporangia. Um, the diploid cells called sporocytes will be able to go through meiosis to produce haploid spores, and those spore walls um, will contain that sporopollenin, which helps them to be able to survive in environments that are not necessarily the best for them. Okay, so there's an example showing the pictures, a cross-section of the spores and the sporangium, and then the difference between the sporophyte and the gametophyte in moss. Oops, sorry. Multicellular gametangia. Gametes are produced within these. This is how we get um, the female and the male parts of flowers. The female gametangia are called archegonia. Those are the ones that produce eggs and where fertilization takes place. The male gametangia are called antheridia, so anthers, and they're the ones that produce the sperm. Okay, so again, this is just looking at a liverwort, um, seeing the difference between those two. Apical meristems. Um, plants are able to grow in part because of these apical meristems are um, found in your roots and your shoots, um, and they allow additional leaves to be able to be formed, especially right now we're seeing a lot of perennials start to come up um, because of the nutrients that are being stored in the meristem so that they can make the proteins they need to for the plant to be able to grow. Um, some other derived traits are the cuticles. What we see on the cover of our leaves is what we had to, um, um, why we had to um, take the leaves that we use in our um, photosynthesis experiment and um, put them in with a little bit of detergent um, to try to break through that cuticle layer. Uh, mycorrhizae, symbiotic associations um, that help the plants um, to get the nutrients they need in their roots. And then there's other secondary compounds that prevent herbivores and parasites from um, eating up the plants. Again, we said that there's fossil evidence that plants um, have been on land for at least 475 million years um, because we found some in some rocks. And that they've, these, the small number of ancestral species that were out there have given rise to, or gave the origins to all the different plants that we have today, okay? So there's looking at it from a times perspective. One is where the land plants showed up. Two, about 50 million years later is when we had vascular plants show up. And then about 120 million years after that is when we started to see the plants that we have in existence today. The gymnosperms and the angiosperms in terms of the seed plants. Um, and then we obviously still have the seedless vascular plants, the mosses, the lycophytes, and the ferns and the pteraphytes. And then we have the non-vascular plants. And we'll talk more about the, the seed plants in our next chapter. Um, but the liverworts, the mosses, and the hornworts. And so all of these make up the land plants. And we typically group land plants based on whether they have vascular tissue or not. The majority of them do. Um, the ones that don't are called bryophytes. Um, this is not considered to be a monophyletic group. Um, there are some relationships still to be determined with this. The seedless vascular plants, as opposed to the seeded vascular plants, can be divided into clads. Um, they're paraphyletic, um, but typically they're in the same organizational level, even if there's a different number within those different types. So we've got the lycophytes and the pteraphytes there. Um, the seeds are your embryos, um, and then the nutrients that it needs are surrounded by a coat. The seed plants are their own clad, and they can be divided into the gymnosperms and the angiosperms. The gymnosperms would be the seeds um, that are naked, the conifers, and then the angiosperms are your flowers, or any of your plants that have flowers. So those are examples of some of the living phyla, um, and I know with the plants you are going to be focusing more on phyla um, I don't remember if you're doing all of these, but I know that um, I think the bryophytes were separate and then you're doing the vascular and the um, the gymnosperms and the angios angiosperms, the seedless, the gymnosperms, and the angiosperms. Okay. Oh, I didn't mean to put questions in here. Sorry about that. Um, so the next section we're going to talk about is bryophytes. Um, we have the liverworts, the hornworts, and the mosses. Um, there is a difference between bryophyte and bryophyta. Uh, bryophytes referring to the plants that aren't vascular. Bryophyta is the specific phylum for mosses. So kind of like we ran to in the last chapter with the plasmodium. Um, be careful what you say. 
Um, so this is getting into how the bryophytes are able to be reproduced. I am not getting into this much detail with you all given the period of time we're in. So if you want to read about it, feel free. There's its um, fertilization meiosis um, cycle. Um, and then again, that's going into a little bit more of the different forms of bryophytes. Um, they're the simplest of the bunch. Um, it talks a little bit about that some of them have stomata and others don't. Okay. Lots of pictures. Um, mosses. Mosses can live in all sorts of environments. Um, they are often found in wet environments, moist forest, wetlands. Um, they can help to retain nitrogen. Peat moss, you might have heard that refer that referred to pr before. It can be a fuel source and um, also a source of carbon. So if you have too much of the sphagnum, the peat, um, taken up, um, you can release a tremendous amount of CO2 into our atmosphere and cause all sorts of not so good effects. Okay. I don't know why I didn't take all these questions. Sorry, guys. Ferns, other seedless vascular plants, the first to get taller. So we've been dealing with small plants so far. Um, the bryophytes were around, or bryophyte-like plants, for the first 100 mil million years when plants started to evolve. And then we started seeing vascular plants in the Devonian and Carboniferous periods, which allowed these plants to get taller. Um, the seedless vascular plants um, have flagellated sperm and are restricted to environments that are more moist. Um, these date back to about 425 million years ago. Um, these early tiny plants had little sporophytes that allowed them to branch independently. And so they are characterized by having life cycles that focus on those sporophytes, having the xylem and phloem, and having well-developed roots and leaves. We didn't really talk about those so much with the last, the bryophytes. So something, um, something to consider that's kind of um, unique, the vascular plants as opposed to the bryophytes, okay? Um, where the bryophytes, um, it, the sporophytes that are of seedless vascular plants are in the larger generation. Um, so that's kind of opposite that of the bryophytes. Um, the gametophytes are the tiny plants that will grow either on or below the, cell sur the soil surface. So again, there's just another cycle of their a life cycle for the vascular plants that are seedless. Okay, um, so they can have xylem and phloem. Um, xylem is what takes up the water and the minerals, um, and they are um, strengthened by lignin. Um, phloem is what helps to take up the nutrients, and these two work in concert to help plants to be able to grow taller and allowing them to have an advantage evolutionary speaking. Okay. Roots help to anchor your vascular plants. They help them to absorb water and nutrients. And it's thought perhaps that these came from subterranean stems, ones that were growing below the soil surface. Leaves help to increase your surface area, capturing more solar energy. You can have um, microfill leaves with, that have a single vein, and you can have megafill leaves that have a highly branched um, vascular system present. Um, thought possibly microfills came from stems, and that megafills um, evolved as webbing between flattened branches. Um, so you're seeing how kind of everything has some sort of connection to being able to survive and continue to thrive. Um, so there's examples of microfills and there's examples of megafills, or at least the hypothesis behind the two. Um, so sporophylls are leaves that have the sporangi on them. And then we talk about sorus, troboli. Um, seedless vascular plants are homosporous. So they make one type of spore that can be either female or male as a gametophyte. Um, the seeded plants and there are some seedless vascular plants are heterosporous, which can produce both megaspores and microspores. The megaspores lead to the female gametophytes, while the microspores lead to the male gametophytes. Okay, um, so the two phyla that fall under the seedless vascular plant section are the lycophyta and the pteraphyta. We talked about those a little bit earlier. 
Um, so the lycophyta again are your mosses, um, the terophyta are your ferns. Um, so lycophyte trees um, live for many, 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 many years in moist swamps. And the small herbaceous plants that exist now are the ones that made it through that. Um, club mosses, spike mosses don't have the vascular tissues. So they are not considered to be mosses in the true extent. Well, the terrified with the ferns, there's a lots and lots of different types of ferns. They're very diverse in the tropics as well as temperate forest. Um, and the whisk ferns are look a lot like the ancestral vascular plants, but they are definitely um, related to your modern ferns. So the ancestors of these lycophytes, why these um, seedless vascular plants um, are being talked about so much um, is that they helped to lead to the first forest once they got growing in the Devonian, Devonian and Carboniferous periods. Um, the growth in the photosynthesis that was generated as a result helped take CO2 out and helped cool the planet down. And when these plants started to decay, um, they gave us sources of coal. Okay. And that would be the end of chapter 29.